start the session, I'm delighted to introduce Matt Craig, Head of Performance and Value Management at BNY Mellon. Matt is an IT CMF certified instructor. He is one of the most influential, influential thought leaders to promote the IT CMF framework due to his experience using it. Matt will now introduce the IBI framework by talking through an international case study of success in the talent management sphere. Thank you, Matt. Well, good morning, folks. It's great to be here. I'm just going to log into my speaker notes. So give me a moment and I'll get started. Here we go. And we're up. So um, what I'm going to share with you today, um, and for those of you who have been to any of other IBI summits know, I like to share some of our story about the journey of ITCMF adoption and uh, capability improvement and, and why we're doing what we're doing and how we're going and some of our challenges. So I'll be doing much the same thing today. Um, you may see some stuff you've seen before. In fact, anyone who is familiar with the framework will certainly see some things that you've seen before. But I, I added in uh, some of the reference material to make sure that anyone who hasn't been exposed to the framework will at least get a little introductory glimpse of some of its parts um, that we find quite helpful. What I hope to, to, to illustrate today is three main things. Um, one is what my company, BNY Mellon, is doing to become a more digital company, to become a company that's a significant player um, in our own market, in our own industry, using digital techniques. So I'll share some of that with you. Um, I'll then share with you some of the information about capability management, about the ITCMF, and what it means to us, and some of the ways that we've really embedded a culture of continuous improvement through some key principles and through use of the framework. And then I'll, I'll finish up with just some illustrations about how those things are coming together to create opportunities for our own people, for our talent, how we're developing leaders, how we're developing talented individuals, how we're empowering them to be key players. And I think there were some really good stories this morning um, from our speakers around how this, uh, this new environment of, of digital is potentially threatening uh, to jobs, but on the other hand is potentially um, a great growth opportunity. So with that, I'm going to share a little bit about BMI Mellon and the digital agent. One of the things that's really key for us, and this is true for most companies, it's not surprising, is this focus on the needs of our clients. Um, now BMI Mellon, and I'll, I'll sort of tell you a little bit more context on the next slide, is really a major player within the financial services industry supporting a huge amount uh, of activity, a huge amount of um, investment services, uh, and really acts as the lifeblood in many cases for so many players um, in the global economy. And yet, our clients, um, the very many that there are, are faced with so many challenges, and some of these challenges are actually coming from this digital era. Um, so this challenge of what's happening in the global markets, you know, what's happening with where should I invest, where should I invest my client's um, portfolio, uh, how do I deal with those challenges, how do I deal with this ever-evolving regulation, things like um, the, 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 the uh, the declines that we've experienced, the challenges, the, 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 uh, um, the many situations that have driven so much change in regulation over the last few years, and this has just been an ever-evolving challenge, uh, especially in the financial service industry. Um, the climbing costs, I mean, while we do continue to get um, cheaper, relatively speaking, with technology, you know, Moore's Law at play, um, there are still continually increasing costs of technology to acquire and implement different technologies, uh, emerging technologies, and those costs continue to, to climb even while we continue to try and minimize uh, that expense. Um, and then of course this sense of fragmented technology, and one of the things it's, it's actually a key challenge for us as an organization, global company in, in, in many, many countries, tens of thousands of people, and also a legacy of many different uh, mergers and acquisitions over a long period of time results in this sort of fragmented technology and that's a challenge for us, it's a challenge for our clients. So when you look at that in the context of what we do, um, I just want to share some notes with you. We don't have both of these on, do we? Good. <laughs> um, but uh, just, just some, 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 some key statistics for you, okay? So we do have a global presence and we serve one-fifth of the world's assets, the one-fifth of the world's financial assets. 80% um, of Fortune 500 companies, 66% of the top pension funds, and my computer just went to sleep, so that's super helpful. Um, luckily, it's fairly quick to come back up. 90% um, of global central bank reserves. Okay, so we're in a unique position to serve these customers in these markets. Um, and the way that we're doing that, and we're increasing this investment, is to leverage the data that we have and the platform assets that we have 
to address those challenges head on, right? To provide these variable cost solutions, right? We're doing this through digital technologies and digital techniques, through data-driven insights. And we heard a little bit earlier again about decision, decision science. And decision science is very much becoming a core part of what's driving our success. Um, uh, you, things like risk management, again, it's a huge issue whether you're talking about regulatory or other factors of risk, that as a financial services institution, um, risk is such a big deal because just a, a small thing going wrong can be a complete catastrophe. Uh, so all of these things come together, these challenges come together, these opportunities for us to serve our clients more effectively come together, and we're leveraging um, digital tools and techniques and knowledge to address these challenges. Okay, so one of the things that we're doing is we're, we're, we're making an investment. We love to talk about investment. We like to talk about investing in ourselves, investing in our clients, investing in our capabilities um, to create a more flexible organization um, that we can also scale, right, to, that we can apply in a global context. Um, we're using service-oriented architecture both at a technical level and at a, an organizational level to be very service-centric with an under, underlying set of capabilities which we manage, and I'll talk about that shortly. So what are some of the ways that that uh, is exhibited? And you'll see here, and this is an unreadable slide, um, but it's, I found it an interesting slide, and I will admit um, that as I was preparing to give this speech, what I typically do is I ask our communications uh, folks and, and, and other folks, because you know, with tens of thousands of people globally, there's a lot of information that we share with the marketplace, with investors, with internal staff, and so on. So I didn't make this slide, but I liked it because it, it, it illustrates that there are many factors at play. Um, some of the key points that we have here as some of our strengths is that we do have a global infrastructure um, and we are evolving a digital ecosystem. And one of the things we've been investing in technically is this thing we're calling a BNY Mellon Extreme Platform. But it's all about how we bring into play the things that you can't read, so my apologies. But uh, one of the things I was very happy to see on this slide, a framework such as ITIL and the ITCMF as a corporate slide that we share with other people. Right? So it's there at the top of the list. Um, things like evidence-based management, things like what are we doing uh, to, to increase our risk competency through threat-based defense, and many other things that are listed here. So it's interesting, in, at least to me, in the sense that we do bring in many uh, aspects of thought leadership and frameworks and models and references uh, and other things to become successful. Uh, you know, we're not a one-size-fits-all company, and one solution is not the solution for everything that we face, and so we bring a lot together, and we've found um, to sort of mentally jump forward a bit, we've found that the structure of the IT capability maturity framework and the thinking that goes along with it has been very helpful in this sense. Uh, just some of the other stats, you can see it on the right hand side of the slide, which I always find uh, fascinating, are things like um, processing $5.9 trillion daily uh, as part of the function of the organization. I mean, just that one number, that one statistic alone, always blows me away. It is the amount of capital that's flowing through the system in some way, being touched in some way, um, and, and with a very high degree uh, of accuracy and reliability, as you would expect, is amazing. And then you think about what goes into that from our technology people, our business, our operations, and so on, to work together in a cohesive fashion to execute on that scale. So some of the ways that this looks like within the context of BNY Mellon itself is this sense, and you'll all be very familiar with this, I imagine, um, a, a fairly typical triad of people, technology, and process coming together to create this ability to change and to improve. Uh, and, and, and again, this, this is not one of my slides, and I'm very happy to find these kinds of things as I'm looking through our content library, if you will, because it shows that it's not just the work that we're doing in terms of adopting the ITCMF and driving continual improvement and improving our capabilities, but we have teams improving processes as their sort of central mission. We have teams improving services. We have teams focused on business unit challenges. Many teams coming together in different ways and, and touching each other in different ways, but all with uh, uh, this uh, impetus to improve the function of the company in a sustainable way. So, um, as you can see here, we are investing in people, we're investing in technology, and we're investing in process change to create uh, that improvement that we want to see. Um, one of the things that's an attribute of the maturity uh, characteristics in the ITCMF is this sense of technology business integration. That if you start having a more integrated um, technology team working with business partners, working with operations, working with vendors and suppliers, this sort of 
sense of a cohesive ecosystem of work coming together to achieve results, then that's one of the characteristics of being more mature and being more effective. And we can see that we have that highlighted here as the, the top point, is that we're approaching this sense of change, the sense of becoming a more capable, agile, service-centric organization in conjunction um, with people throughout the business, including our technology staff. Um, the other point here, which I thought was very relevant to the, to the uh, theme of this conference, was the sense of talent and the sense of investment in the best training and mentorship. And we have very strong uh, internal function. We actually have a, a thing that's called BMI Mellon or BK University that was created roughly two or so years ago. Um, how all the disparate learning groups in the organization came together uh, as a cohesive entity to, to become much better at empowering and training and, and developing our talent. Um, and, and it was a great investment and it's really been, been paying off and it's been very helpful even in the context of us adopting the ITCMF. Um, one of the other challenges we see this on the third bullet is this sense of changing the culture by addressing the breadth of change required at all levels. And it really is such a critical point. Um, I was almost going to ask our uh, esteemed uh, presenters this morning, um, all of them mentioned this difficulty of, of implementing change that you know to be needed. Uh, the, uh, the scurvy example was, was a really good one from Tim because it was like, hey, we've known that uh, vitamin C is uh, a scurvy preventer for 50 years before it becomes, uh, or 60 years before it becomes something that's actually implemented as, as, as an official fix. Um, and, and I find that fascinating, and then there are other examples, and we experience the same for ourselves. We know what we need to do, and yet it's difficult to implement those good changes. So, some other aspects of, of, of us at BMY Mellon as a digital organization, and, and, and some of this is a little bit more back on the technology um, side of things, um, but people are woven within this, this sense of building a digital enterprise. Um, and one of the things we're doing, and it's a very exciting time, is that we're acting with partners throughout the industry to create this, um, this ability to uh, engage in a, providing financial services through a digital ecosystem on a platform that we've been developing and, and again developing in conjunction with many others um, based on a lot of uh, emergent technology and techniques, things like big data and the cloud, those kinds of things, um, to, to create a system that allows uh, everyone in the industry to come together and more effectively serve the needs of their clients, get rid of all waste and redundancy and, and confusion and complexity um, through things like developed APIs that other people to um, execute transactions and those kinds of things, you know, building in foundational services that work so you don't have to keep recreating, say, the ability to produce a report and those kinds of things. And what I find fascinating about that is that a lot of that has been driven by the skills and the, the competency of our staff, of our people. We've invested a lot in internalizing a lot of this um, development of specialist skills to be able to create these kinds of systems so that we can then offer them out to the industry. So as an example, and this slide is not behaving for me, um, but one of the things we have is this thing called digital pots. Um, again, as a big financial services institution, we have a lot of data, a lot. Uh, and yet, historically, we haven't been that great at, at leveraging it, at using it for decision making, at, at using it to understand what's going on both within the organization as well as in the wider world and for our clients on behalf of them. So this has been an emerging theme that we've been developing for a while, and it's an embedded part of this ecosystem that we've been developing, is this ability to both internally manage the company more effectively through what we call evidence-based management, based on this foundation of, of much more effective data management, um, with these sort of four main aspects of capturing the data, storing it so that it's effective, you can retrieve it effectively, actually being able to analyze it, again, using things like decision science to understand what's going on, and then drive action. Right, so that also is at the heart of what we've been doing, and it's very, very much reflected in, say, uh, our ITCMF journey, um, as an example. Uh, executive assessments, many of you may be familiar with them, an ability to fairly quickly capture the sense of maturity throughout the organization, an understanding of the importance of different capabilities, um, and then providing that information to decision makers and practitioners so that we can act on driving change to, to create a group. So with that context, uh, hopefully you can see that, uh, you know, as an organization, again, one of the other thing I didn't mention, it's pretty old. It's been around for, uh, probably get this wrong, but 220 years or something like that, and has been ever evolving and changing over that time to remain successful. Um, 
and, and so the, the, digital, the digital world uh, and the challenges of the day, they're not part of the course, right? This isn't just business as usual. We have to keep learning and growing and evolving. And I think certainly that sense of discomfort, being in that kind of zone of discomfort, it is something that many of us are familiar with. It doesn't mean you're comfortable with it, um, but, but you certainly get familiar with being in a place that you're not comfortable with, that's different, that you have to handle, and you have to be an active participant in changing. So with that then, we can talk a little bit about what is our version, how, how are we using the ITCMF, and what are we defining and what have we used as characteristics to help us drive change. Okay. So uh, again, I, I would almost say apologies because uh, many people have seen this, but many people have not. Okay. So this is one of the standard views of the structure of the framework itself. Okay. And it shows us that there are, even at this, at this view, you can see that there are multiple ways to approach the framework. You can see that at the top level, there are what we're calling here high-level capabilities, or you may be familiar with them as macro capabilities, things like how do we manage IT like a business, and what are the capabilities within that sphere? Or how do we manage IT to create business value, and what are the capabilities found in there? And then you can see that those capabilities are actually listed. And that, that set of capabilities, both each, for each capability and on mass, is continually evolving and changing. And we can see an example of that even here within the book. Um, the book contains content that wasn't previously available because it's been undergoing certain editing and revision um, that we've had access to previously in the wiki, for instance. And, and I think that's a great essential element of the framework itself. Because it is the expression of a community of practice. Um, and it will continue to evolve and change. So we find that to be very valuable. We find this sense of maturity level is very accessible for people to understand, where we can talk about what does level one look like and what does level two look like. So we sort of have this reference slide here. We, we use it quite a bit in things like our assessments or in discussions with business peers and things like that. So well, you know, maybe for one capability, we may say we're somewhere around a two plus, two to three, whatever it is. What does that mean? Well, that means that our practices, yes, we have some things embedded and we have some practices and some, some, some guidance uh, published and available, but it's adopted sporadically and the, the outcome is difficult to assess and that's a bit of a challenge and we find that we're, you know, many people are a bit confused. Those kinds of things, that's kind of a level two state, if you will. Well, would you like to be a little bit more standardized, a little more streamlined? Would you like people generally to have a good understanding of what this practice area entails, what this capability means. You know, what does it mean to manage risk? What does it mean to decrease cost? What does it mean to be innovative? Right? So we say, well, we probably would like to be more mature at that for whatever reason. Right? What are the business challenges we're trying to address? And therefore, you can have this discussion on any topic about maturity and about effectiveness. And you can certainly generally stimulate agreement that it would be a good thing to become more mature and effective. So that's a good thing, because then you say, great. How do we do that? Okay. Um, so one of the other things, as I mentioned, is sort of the, 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 the composition of the framework itself. And I've always found this uh, sort of conceptual slide very useful in the sense that because you have different layers or levels of detail within the framework, you have an ability to engage with it, to use it for different purposes at different levels of the organization. At a very detailed practitioner level, you know, someone who's a project manager, and says, I, you know what, I'm, I'm managing my projects and I'm struggling a little bit and there's just a couple of things I'd really like to get a little bit better at. So, well, you know, what is that? Well, let's explore that. Let's understand what the opportunities are. And they might identify, you know, maybe if we had some better planning practices in place, we'd have better downstream results. Or perhaps if we managed our requirements more effectively, whatever those detailed practices are. And you'll find examples of that at that lowest level. It was sort of saying here over 2,000 practices, outcomes, and metrics. And Jim would probably tell me the, the, the right number as it stands today, because again, it tends to evolve over time. But if you're at a higher level, uh, and you may be, may be talking to an executive, and you're talking perhaps about a challenge with the ability to execute on strategic objectives, uh, and, and you might say, well, you know, perhaps what we're challenged with is the, uh, perhaps, immaturity in our portfolio prioritization practices. And you know, maybe those are inconsistent, or not well applied, or not well understood. And we can sort of go to a more macro level and talk about that as an opportunity for improvement. Um, we'll go to the very top level and talk about the ability of technology to meet the needs of the business and, and create value uh, in a measurable way. Uh, and so sort of there at that level, you might look at one of those macro capabilities like, like managing IT for business value and address it that way. So that's been super helpful um, to be able to engage in dialogue at those different levels that's meaningful for the person that you're talking to. So with that, one of the things that we did do, and um, Martin, Curly, 
mention this, where did I see my, oh, there it is, um, about using the uh, CMF as one of the points of reference to start developing the ITCMF itself. We did something similar in the sense that we created what we call the What Works List, and we haven't come up with a better name, we've been saying the What Works List for so long now that we just stuck with it. Um, was a set of principles and practices that are um, found actually in many reference frameworks, like the CMI has something called the General Practices. Um, there's another framework called the, uh, the e-sourcing capability model that also has what are called support practices. And there's a range of other ones that all have this sense of like, what are the cornerstone pieces that you need to embed and instill to be successful? And we've sort of broken them down to these three main areas of, do you have a commitment to change? And a commitment to change means leadership commitment, someone kind of has their name on the line to be owning the, at least a domain in this case, if we're talking about capabilities. Who's responsible for that, for the organization? And are they actually signed up for it? Is it part, is it part of their performance system? Um, and will they be appropriately compensated either way if things go well or poorly? Uh, it's critical. So that sense of executive sponsorship is not just someone saying, go forth and, and make something happen, but someone actually embedded and, and uh, involved in making sure it does happen and that it's an important uh, initiative. Uh, making sure that you do have effective change leaders, we found that to be very challenging. We talked a little bit about sort of that 10% uh, issue. Um, it, it, it's, it's what we've seen uh, in, in our implementation with dozens of teams um, that we see those folks who act as change leaders um, correlate very strongly with teams being effective at, at creating change. Um, but there are many other factors, and you sort of see them here, I won't read them all out because there's quite a few and, and you'll have this available. Um, but clear goals are, are essential as well. Where are we going and why are we going there? What does that outcome look like? And it's not the end of the road, it never is. You know, we're on this journey of continual improvement, but we have to define some clear milestones along the way that are attainable that people can see and be empowered to move towards. Um, and I think some of the discussion about uh, the, you know, posing the suggestions uh, on effective change are very relevant uh, in this case. So, uh, you know, other ones, uh, you know, time and funding resources, do we have them or not? Uh, again, a key success factor, and, and again, we've seen examples where we, if we do, it tends to help a lot. And if we don't, nothing very much happens. Um, to move down, this sense of building a world-class capability really is two main things. It's having a community of practice that's, that's embedding the change, that's part of the change, that's driving the change, and that's being um, based upon something that's tangible. Right, whether it's written standards, guidelines, documentation, tools and techniques, templates, whatever it is, but there are some assets to the practice that are being developed and evolved and used by the community in conjunction with the team who's leading the change. And then finally, at the end, we want to make sure that it's actually working. Right? So we want to apply that sense of measurement. I mentioned evidence-based management. We want to make sure that we have measures, and this is a bit of a measurement spectrum that we, we tend to apply, moving from do we have the resources, are they doing the work, are they creating the, the deliverables and the outcomes that we're looking to create, but I'm talking about outcomes, moving towards is there a business impact, is there a tangible change, you know, are we simplifying the organization, are we making things less expensive, are we making things simpler and easier, whatever those outcomes are depending on the capability. And of course the last one that we had there, things like rewards and recognition, we have many unsung heroes in this space. Uh, and so it's a challenge, quite honestly, to think of better ways and more ways to empower and recognize people for the great work they do, because there are so many of them. Uh, and we're getting better at that. We're getting better at that. It's certainly an important principle. So this one, I was thinking of my friend Gar. Where's Gar? It's hard to see the last. There he is. But uh, any of you who have seen a, a, a Gar a presentation know that it's chock full of Gar sketches. So um, I put this one in just as a sort of a, a little bit of an extra bonus slide. Because one of the big challenges that we've been facing uh, for a little while is the sense of, well, should we be focused on services or should we be focused on capabilities, right? And it's like, well, services or capabilities, services or capabilities. The thing is, it's not a good question because you really need both as an organization. You need to be able to provide service. You need to be able to integrate the functions of the organization to create the valuable outcomes that services are designed to, to deliver. But you also need to invest in those cross-organizational capabilities, right? Every part of the organization needs to be good at managing projects, managing people, managing finances, being in it, right? So both are necessary. And what we're offering here is this sense of what I had showed earlier, this sort of these core principles found in our What Works list do form this cornerstone for both. And we've been applying it for both. So we're working both on the front of <coughs> defining and improving our services 
as an end-to-end -end ability to create value and in improving our capabilities as a means to create standard and effective ways of getting certain types of work done. So with that, I just want to share again a few stories around how we've used some of these principles and applied them within the space of investing in our town. All right, so one of our examples is that we want our staff and our teams to be more collaborative. So we've been investing in these things that we call our innovation centers. They're more open collaborative spaces. They're physical spaces with other digital electronic support um, that both helps us engage with people better virtually as well as in place so that we can drive additional innovation through the thoughts and expertise of our people. Okay, so that's one example. Um, and hopefully you'll see that based on some of those principles I shared from that What Works list, a lot of that sense of, of uh, executive sponsorship, provision of resources, uh, setting goals, making sure there are people involved as a community, those kinds of things come together and help us to create something like an innovation center and having that as a global presence. Um, one of the other examples is that we run a lot of different things like events and competitions and campaigns and different business initiatives and again look to engage the breadth of our staff to be involved with creating these solutions. To, to not just be, hey, tech people, you're off doing tech stuff, but we're going to get you involved. Oh, I guess it's going to keep running on me. <laughs> Another one is an example, again, more about driving innovations. We have this, uh, this ACE competition, which we run, and we've run it a few times now. And it's a bit of fun. Uh, everyone gets involved to contribute thoughts and ideas about how we can drive great innovative change, great valuable change for the company. Um, wow, the slide really, I'm, not, I'm not touching anything. And the last one <laughs> is, it's, 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 it's a thing we're very proud of is that we have some fantastic what we call employee resource groups that help um, engage uh, people uh, on different types of topics such as um, a group that's really focused on empowering and engaging women in the workplace. It's a bit of a challenge particularly in technology uh, so we're very proud to have received this year um, the, the award for being the top company for women in technology by the Indian Board Institute. Um, and none of those things would have happened if we weren't using those underlying investment priorities and themes that I, that I sort of shared with you as a basic view in that what works list and that sense of what we're doing to use the ITCMF as a framework to help us improve our capabilities um, is an example. As I showed you on that other really detailed list of all those pieces, it's not the only thing, but it's a very helpful element for us. So, thank you very much.